Hi, welcome to our virtual artist talk here at Catalyst Contemporary in Baltimore. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Brian Miller. I'm the director of the gallery. Uh, I'm joined by Holly Roberts uh, in Corrales, New Mexico, and Tian Uk uh, in Baltimore. I also wanted to let you know that behind the scenes is Liz Faust, uh, managing all the technology as she usually does for our uh, virtual artist talks. Um, thanks for joining us. As I've said, I wanted to let you know that uh, you can always uh, type in questions throughout the artist talk uh, in the comments section and we'll try to address them. Um, I, I wanted to take a minute to introduce each of the artists. Um, the artists this evening will be presenting a little bit of a talk before we have some uh, questions and and answers. So uh, I wanted to introduce Holly first. Um, Holly has been uh, working in photo-based uh, collage and painting collage over the last uh, 30 years, 30, 40 years. Um, she's had uh, two books published, eight uh, works, uh, Holly Roberts works 89 to 99 and 2000 to 2009. Um, sort of comprehensive look at those uh, decades. Um, she's been the recipient of two NEA artist grants, as well as the Ferguson grant uh, from the Friends of Photography. Um, Tiang is a uh, young artist here in Baltimore uh, who's just completed his MFA from the Hofberger School at the Maryland Institute College of Art. So congratulations, Tiang. Thank you. Uh, on that. Um, we've brought these two artists together uh, at Catalyst. Uh, the title of their show is Transmogrify. Uh, I think you'll find their work uh, wild and engaging, um, allowing us to enter into different worlds, worlds that they've imagined and envisioned, um, particularly in this show uh, with characters uh, and spaces from these envisioned worlds. Uh, we brought you guys together uh, because of the dialogue that the, the works uh, had with each other. We thought, found it really fascinating, um, the language and the imagery. Um, I think, you know, as part of the uh, process here, we wanted to give you guys some space to talk individually about the work and um, which one did you want to go first? I think Tian. Uh, yes, correct. Thank you. All right, Tian, yeah. fire away. And um, again, just a reminder, if you have any comments out there, um, questions for the artists or myself, um, please go ahead and type them in and we'll, we'll address them along the way. Yeah, thank you. First of all, you know, I want to thank everyone who's involved in, uh, you know, this show. That's, you know, Holly, Brian, of course, Liz as well. And uh, it's been definitely a privilege to show with such a caliber of artists and, uh, you know, the, you know, everyone with Brian and Liz again. So thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess I can introduce myself a little background and then I can do my screen, screen sharing. So originally from Myanmar and uh, it's important, I guess, because it's, uh, it's the motif is always uh, in my work as well um in terms of like being uh immigrant and adjusting to my environment so i and uh i moved to florida when i was about 12. so that's uh a lot of different landscape and motifs are going to be present in there all right i want to share my screen here okay All right. Awesome. Can you guys see that, Brian? Yeah. We can. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I want to talk about the work that I have in the show. Uh, I made this pres presentation based on the physical uh, gallery and starting from the left, and then I want to go left to right. And uh, this is the first uh, one of the first pieces that you, you're going to see in the in the gallery. And 
This one, I did it at uh, Hunter College when I was in New York, and I was really thinking a lot about uh, being a migrant. This was also around the time that uh, Trump was uh, elected president. Um, so a lot of people around my, uh, my group and my collective also start to think about, I guess, identity in a different way. Um, and more, it was, that conversation was uh, a lot more uh, put on forth and so on. So um, me being uh, Asian, Asian American who's migrated, um, I thought, you know, it's, it was one of way that I, I should engage in uh, as well. So this uh, piece was really a lot inspired by Marston Hartley, uh, the portrait of a German soldier, uh, which if I can just des describe it, um, it's like a makeup of, of a lot of different symbols and colors and basically essentially like abstract work. And there's no face, you know, there's no, there's nothing uh, in, uh, in the painting in the Martian Harley painting. And that's what I was thinking of. How can I make my, like a portrait really to get a sense of where I'm coming from and a sense of my identity, maybe in the sense of confusion, like as well, but I will cover that in more in the next few paintings as well. Tian, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, did, did something about, um, the political environment make you confused about um, your relation to your own identity? Well, that yeah, it, I mean, in a sense, it was very, you know, uh, intense time for all of us, I'm sure, you know, but uh, I was a young student in New York and I never really thought about uh, politics, certainly not American politics in that sense, you know, coming from Burmese, um, background you know it's very chaotic you know uh background and coming here is you know in america it was kind of safe haven and you know the fact that trump become president in and i was in new york you know that discussion was really um had to be you know had to happen so we were discussing a lot about you know a lot about that and also i was taking asian american literature as well and you know think about uh my uh, childhood and background and what, what does it mean to be Asian American? Um, so that's what I was, you know, trying to engage with, Brian, if that answered your question. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this, so this one, I, uh, this one was very influenced by like uh, Asian American, I mean, Chinese calligraphy and art class that I took and I was starting to become interested in the hybrid between um, Asian, like East Asian art and more European painting style and how could I make them together. And, but also, you know, there's a lot of like things that I want to explore between there in a sense of my identity as well, but in a sense of like pictorial sense as well, for example, uh, the flatness and the illusion, um, you know, and it's and it's not that simple in the sense of like, you know, illusion uh, that reference European, but and more flatness and, you know, Asian art, but that's how I kind of like start to engage with that. Um, and you can see a lot of different mountain imagery on the, the wall, the painted wall on the background and type of also I would start to think about how you know, the boundary between my my body and the landscape, how in my landscape and environment influence me as a person and how I also influence my landscape, the people around me. Uh, so this is kind of like, um, kind of literal in a sense, you know, since the body and the, the skin type of color starts to um, evaporate onto the landscape and into the room. And the next painting is this one. Um, it's called Moonlit Gatherer or something. I'm terrible with remembering my own title. So, <laughs> um, and 
this I, I did it after I graduated from Hunter and I this was I painted in a small corner of you know uh, my parents' house trying to save money for grad school and this was uh, the bigger painting that I did during then and I wanted to look at a, a few Burmese motifs and one of the resources that I looked was uh, Burmese sculpture and. Um, Brian, can you see my mouse or no? Yes. Oh, okay. Awesome. Great. And so this particular figure was uh, from Burmese sculpture in uh, Bagan. That's a place in uh, Burma, ancient city in Burma. And a lot of different portals. That's kind of, I guess, me accepting like um, people and also expressing myself as a person and accepting people in the sense of their complexity um and yeah in terms of formally i was exploring a lot of the the different colors i wanted to make how i could make uh you know non-pretty color and how could i make them like look more interesting more cohesive or less cohesive so there's kind of um, a lot going on but it's no, it's one of my favorite pieces, I think. Well, the exploration of color, I feel like in your work creates a certain atmosphere. And where, whereas you were talking about in the last painting, this confluence of, of this, you know, Asian identity art, which, which addresses space and shapes in space a lot differently than in Western. You can see that coming in here with the color, the colors themselves start to create um, atmospheric spaces within the forms of the bodies, which is really fascinating the way that the form fades into some other visual experience, uh, in the work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Brian. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I, I was trying to do a lot. Um, creating a landscape within the figure themselves, I guess it was also, uh, I was thinking about how, you know, one carry memories of, um, places and culture so i was thinking of my own family and uh but the atmosphere is a really important word for me that you brought uh, uh brian so it's gonna be that that's one thing that I, that always seemed to come natural to me and only recently i've started to really tapping onto that more consciously mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is a kind of a more specific motiva motivator, I, I guess, behind the the, the painting. Uh, the time that I did it, I was becoming an American citizen, citizen. I was trying to make appointment and all that stuff. It took a very long time. It's a very complex process. Um, so I... Do, doing that whole long process and quite painful and annoying process, you know, you have a lot of time to think about um, what does it mean to gain uh, citizenship and lose uh, lose a different citizenship as well. What you know, why are you becoming and what are you leaving behind? And that's what. I was thinking about and the title of the painting is called allegiance and it's kind of directly just referencing to that but you could also see different motifs and like red white stripe that's american cut like obviously american flag reference and i was also thinking about patterns um and landscape and i was thinking about how landscape have its own type of like uh, i guess culture um mirage and i it, that's what i was trying to create in the pictorial sense um it's just trying to create a sort of rhythm into my painting as well um but also the background that there's a lot of mountains so that's uh, i was kind of born in a Valley, so that was a, ref a direct reference to that. I mean, of my birthplace. Mm -hmm. This one, yeah, this one is uh, also 
thinking about uh, my childhood as well. And the, the background of this painting is referencing the city that I, I was born in as, uh, as well. So kind of like a distant look at that um, memory. And I didn't want to try to depict like an, uh, trying to make a fake, a fake memory of it, but I, I wanted to, to make like my own sort of memory through the painting. So I was very tentative of my um, flatness of the painting, for example, the, the colors of the windows and so on. And uh, the figure itself, um, I was thinking about like leaving family behind, like my grandparents and also, you know, that could be my grandparents and also that could be myself as well. Um, sort of like last goodbye thing. The figure is so amorphous here. You don't know. It looks like someone's turning away and moving, but it also looks like someone's like, like the, <laughs> like the, but there's like a shape of a body moving away, but you don't know if it's forward or backward, if the head's on forward or backward. And there's this really um, tension in the positioning that you've created with the figure um that it's going back to this place or lifting out of it you know yeah exactly yeah exactly that's what i want to capture a moment um you know but uh, like also embrace the multiplicity of the you know the form i and looking at um east asian art that's one thing that you know, I think the highlight of it is that there's this one book that said, great image have no form. So basically the form that I'm trying to uh, try, try to make also, they, I want them to embody a lot of different things as well. And that figure is definitely uh, one of that type of um, form that I wanted to, you know, hopefully embody a lot of different people and different mm -hmm. things. Yeah, this is a similar line of line of thinking and engaging. I, I think um, I was thinking about my environment uh, in the sense of uh, landscape and culturally, and how kind of they clash and kind of like work together and change pattern together. And this is all within. Um, with you know inside me I, I suppose so i was trying to make this simple figure that i could just you know put everything in um a lot of my composition tried to be too complex i think so i kind of lose freedom uh, sometime in that in that way in terms of gesture and so on so this one i i remember my goal was make just making a simple form and then work with that so you could see a lot of different and small motifs within uh, within the figure like um water also mountains patterns different lightings and also focusing on the the physicality um of the figure as well and you could also see the reference of water in there and you know water still is even today that's a big thing in my that's a big thing in my painting oh sorry um that's a big thing in my painting and i think it's reference it's reference like the fact that i come o over here from a different continent and also was raised in florida um and now i'm you know i'm a very much east coast person as well so that's and this the fact is it is also like a shape shifter water is just like and i was thinking about how that's basically me adapting to different things different culture mm. yeah this is uh the la my last painting of the the, the show and just call a state of uh ecstasy and uh I was trying to 
think of how different form could embody different things. So I guess I was, I must have been thinking about like, uh, you, you know, my young younger self, like childhood, and you know, teenage self, and so on, and uh, but also thinking about um, the medium the physicality of the medium. So I was really trying to focus on that, on this one as well. So on this one, I was trying to, you know, I was motivated to, to find the colors that just look uh, more aesthetically pleasing and trying to create that sense of ec ecstasy. Um, and I think this is more relating to a studio practice, like, you know, the ecstasy and the struggle uh, of uh, making an artwork. Mm. It's interesting that you were talking earlier about the landscape as motif, where I see a lot of your figures that are, um, I see the figure as a motif uh, here where you see, it's almost like the, the Russian um, doll where there's one inside of another, inside of another, inside of another. And you work with that idea a lot. And it's, it comes through as these characters shedding or growing or um, transforming um, into something else. Uh, um, that that shape-shifting aspect that you just mentioned. Absolutely, yeah, I love that comment, Brian. That's uh, that's definitely something that I'm still working with. I'm still fa fascinated by, you know, shape-shifting, and that's one of the myths that um, I, you know, we specifically have in the in my birthplace. So I guess we can talk about the, the mythology of um, both Holly's and my own work, you know, in a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of shape shifting, uh, thanks, Theong. That was a great segment. Work. Okay. Um, okay. Is this stop sharing? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, my screen is froze. froze up. Holly, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, I think that, that, okay. Uh, that thought of the shape shifting would be a good, uh, a good um, way to um, transition over into um, your talk a little bit. Um, for some reason, I just got all this um, Carlos Castaneda imagery stuck in my head, moving between <laughs> and moving conversations here. So um, maybe without you know further ado, you could launch into a little bit about your work. Okay. So Brian, it's funny that you would say that because as I, as we were watching Chang's work, I kept thinking shaman, and of course Carlos Castaneda was a huge influence. Chang, do you know who he is, Carlos Castaneda? Oh, uh, sounds familiar, but nothing comes he, to mind. He he was a, a anthropologist. He went to the desert. He discovered this medicine or this magic guy, Don Juan, and he wrote I don't know seven books about his experience, and they were about that shamanistic culture and when i see your work I'm, i think i think of that you know and i think there's there's a thing going on i don't know if telling aware of it or not but it's about this trying to tap this other side you know to yeah. to hmm. so um this one I, this is the oldest piece in the show it's called breathing um and when i first started out i would i would take uh, black and white photographs um print them out in my dark room and then i would paint over them very very heavily with oil paint and use the bits of the photographic information to determine um, what the piece was about. So I don't know what I'm gonna do when I start out. I'm, I'm totally led by my unconscious. I tell my students that I, I think it's not what we know that's interesting, but it's what we don't know. So unless I'm surprised and, and sort of uh, unaware of what's going to happen, it doesn't work. So I sort of have to turn over. Again, I think it's a shamanistic thing. I have to turn over to this other voice. And this is really, um, the, the actual photograph was from, a, I, I had a Halloween costume where it had white face and I was a skull. And so it ends up being about struggling to breathe about, and I, I think it, it, in all our work, I think we're always speaking metaphorically. And to come back and label it, I think it's helpful, but I'm not sure it's always accurate. Uh, next image. Um, these are. This is called uh, broken, and the and the images, the piece, the photographic bits are actually Julian Schnabel um, bits that I got from a show of his, and uh, and and put it together and made this boat. 
which is made of broken pieces of things. Um, and it's really about this. And, and what I do when I start is I do a painting. I have no idea wh where the painting's going to go. I do maybe 10 or 20 of them. And then I start to come back and lay the, the images down. So I just have stacks and stacks of photographs. Of, I have a whole folder with hands and another one with noses and eyes. And, and so I had this lovely figure of this lonely woman and then this sort of sea-like feeling. And then I just love that these were Julian Schnabel, you know, broken pieces. So that's <laughs> what this piece is about. Next one. Uh, this is called dog dancing. I'm I'm always sticking animals into my images. Um, they're they're so much a part of my world awareness and who I am and 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 what goes on with me. So the other thing I do is I photograph dead animals. That's the best way for me to get you know wild animals is when they've been hit by a car or find them dead. So a lot of times when I'm doing these images, I'm, I'm sort of like bringing them back to life. The other thing is, is to use things that are something else and make them become another thing. So the center of the dog is actually a, a, a burl from an aspen tree. It's, they, mm. they make these amazing eyes. And then the leg is a coyote leg. And again, this is, I have hundreds of, not hundreds, but I have lots and lots of photographs of either dead or live coyotes. We, we live in an area that has lots of coyotes, so they come into our images a lot. But the head itself was a dog I had. Uh, um, for about 15 years, just a wonderful dog who, who was very dear to me. So it was sort of bringing him back to life, sort of giving him another, another life. So dog dancing. Next image. Um, horses are again, another huge part of my, my reality. I grew up, I was a little, I think when I was four years old, I traded my bottle for a pair of cowboy boots. That's how long I've been connected with horses. And so I find them to be very important to me. There's like this thing that's going on where I'm trying to go through to what animals mean and what they are. And I can't really do it. I mean, they're animals and I'm a human, but I think I'm constantly trying to reach through to that other consciousness. And, and I'm not a, like a dog whisperer, a horse whisperer or anything, but I am completely fascinated and involved and have always taken photographs of animals around me. So this is, um, I think it's called a uh, horse with birds resting. And you can see that the horse's body is made up of, of bark and, and sticks and leaves. And then um, uh, the birds, some are birds that I found dead. <laughs> some are ones that I actually photographed, but they're resting on the horse, sort of, sort of all resting. He's, he's resting, they're resting. Uh, next image. Uh, this is a piece that I did. Um, uh, it, 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 I, I was doing a lot of graffiti work where I was finding graffiti and then using it uh, in my images. And it's really quite a journey when you start looking at graffiti um, yeah. and, and just the writing, the, the symbols, the um, uh, just everything about it. And then trying to combine it and to make this image. And here's this love me truck. You know, what is that saying? Um, I feel like... The, the, and then, of course, the fuck you to kind of, you know, love me truck, but then push you away. Right. Um, sort of this journey. Um, and there's there's more graffiti in there down at the bottom. And again, the painting guides it. When I first started out, I started out with oil paint over the photos. And then in 2004, I switched to painting with acrylics and then putting the photo on top. So it's a huge, mm -hmm. huge shift, huge shift. And also it had to do with learning to use digital photography, digital Photoshop, all of that, mm. um, instead of my darkroom. So yeah. next image. Could I ask a quick question? Yep. Um, te texture seems to become the background of all these uh, works, and they, and they're really they're really important. Each texture informs or allows the figures to come out. Um, um, is that something that's very conscious, like the the um, use of that space? Um, I mean, it sounds like they're, they're very just, however it comes out, that's what comes out. But, um, or is there a relationship between the textures and the colors and the, the photo works that you put together? Yeah. I mean, it's this incredible unconscious dance. When I do the paintings, I just throw paint and drip it and pour it. And, you know, it's like this crazy dance I do. Yeah. And then when I go to make the image, I have to start to find photographs, pieces that will work 
with that with that paint. Okay. Um, and, and it's crazy. I mean, I, I have I, I never quite know when I start where I'm going to go, and then then it's like bread comes in the forest. So there'll be one bread crumb and then another bread crumb. And then sure. But the painting determines it. The, the painting says, I need this. Pay attention, Holly. Come on, get going. Right. So then I develop it. Uh, next image. So last year, 2020, COVID, of course, we're all just hanging in there. I went back to using oil paint. and um, But I, I sort of did it in a reversed way. I made the collage. Um, using different pieces of photographs and then I came back in with oil paint and painted over it and it was interesting because it's such a different process I, I don't know Tiang if you use um, oils and acrylic or but there's they're just like different animals so it's sort of like remembering how to use the oils how to how to um, they I, I like to work with before they dry so I had to do them at one sitting um, but I was pleased it was, it was sort of an exciting adventure to get back to oil mm. this is called rabbit walking. Um, we have tons of rabbits where I live. They're not the sharpest tacks in the box. Um, so I'm always trying to photograph them before they get hit by a car. <laughs> anyway, I have lots of rabbits and rabbit heads. Um, next image. Um, one of the things I'm doing now more and more is I'm painting and then using the paintings to form the image instead of the photograph. But there's almost always some photographic element. So in this case, I had painted the background, and then I had all these um, different magazines, newsprints. This was from our atlas um, that I did this ink drawing and then put the photographic eyes on. But it's called Double Bird. Next image. These are all works, just a reminder, the, the initial works that we just saw up to are all in the show at Catalyst exactly. uh, right yeah. now. Yeah. Exactly. So you can see the real things if you're there yeah. in Baltimore. So now this is recent, very, very recent work. Um, I've been trying to do big things um, because then they're harder to ship and more trouble to store. So why not make your life more difficult? So right. um, these are, again, this, I think this is just a beautiful example of how I take photographs and then combine them to make something else. Again, my coyote theme. Um, I've been doing a bunch of mothers. This is called Coyote Mother. And I think it's, it's that terrible thing that's happening with us with climate change, where I just feel like we're getting further and further away from what matters. And I think this unconscious part of me is like desperately grabbing at animals to try and say, listen, look at this. This is important. These are the animals. They're connected to the earth. They're not screwing up. You know, they're, they're part of it all. And I think that's, that's what keeps coming out in these, these mother images. So that's the coyote mother, her babies, and on either side. Uh, next image. Uh, this is just a very recent one. Uh, this is a combination of a coyote carcass that I'd photographed. And then not too long ago, we had a coyote in the field next to us who, for the entire day, was in the field. And I think she may have been pregnant and maybe was getting ready. I don't know. She just didn't go away. But I got yeah. lots and lots of photographs of her head. And watched her, and, and and you know, throughout the day took photographs, and then ended up with this lovely little painting called Coyote Playing. Mm -hmm. Next image. And these are all 2021. These are all since January. So oh, here's wow. Forest Forest Mother, and again, I think it's that same theme. She's made up of the earth. She's surrounded by animals. She's got a, one of those rabbits in her arms. Um, she's she's part of the part of the, and it sounds so hokey but it's not i mean it's really this big concern that i have i think that so many of us have that that we just have to got to do something you know and and if that forest mother can step in and help out then that's what we need uh next image is the is the mother motif is this um if i may sorry to stop you but is it um are you referring to something innately maternal in all of us or something in nature or is it a is it is it obviously personified sense of care i think it's all of those brian i think that's, okay. that's a great question because i think it's the big mother you know okay. gaia um sure. the, the the mother that takes care of us you know that the, mm -hmm. the good mother and then 
the, the, anyway, yeah, th that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to understand how we are both of the world. Um, but somehow we have trouble taking care of it the way that other animals don't seem to just exactly. um, utilize it in the same way and yeah. cause the same problem. So. Right. I think yeah. that's exactly it. And I think in my own human way, I'm trying, my unconscious wants me to investigate that and look at it and talk about it mm -hmm. because consciously the words don't make, don't help much. I think it's for me, it's that, that artist thing that we do. Um, this is another horse image. Um, I've been working with, um, is it called paint peels? What you do is you take um, acrylic paint, latex paint, you spread it out on plastic, you let it dry, and then you can peel it back up. So then I take it and put it back down in different combinations. Huh. So the blue and the green are paint peels, as, as are the legs, and then the head and the tail are photographic. And then I came back in with oil paint to finish the background. Hmm. So it's a horse turning. Our next image. This is very recent. I just glued it yesterday. Um, and it's called Coyote Mother with Clouds. Uh, so another coyote mother. And again, I think it's just what she's made of, um, that, that, that she is nature, we are nature. And that's that coyote that was in the field that, was, huh. that I was so engaged with. Um, next are you using more color uh, photographs in your work now? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's, that's a good point, Brian. I've just now, in the last year or so, Ooh. began to use more and more color photographs. Um, it's harder because it's harder to get the color to work with the painted, painted background. Yeah. Black and white's a little bit easier. And then the, the her skirt is made up of um, phone book pages that I was using to clean up with, huh. as is the ground. So I use anything I can, you know, to 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 make it happen. The yeah. tail is from a dead fox that I photographed. Mm. Um, so, and the clouds are there were graffiti on a wall. That I just love, so I've used them a number of times. Um, next image. This one is again. I just finished. I just glued it up yesterday, um, and this is um, for about the past year since COVID. I discovered a, a horse. A, a neighbor had a horse that needed riding, and it just changed my life. I mean, it allowed me to get out and have this connection with this animal. And he's this giant horse. And when I get on them, I just, <laughs> this is what I feel like. <laughs> so this is, this is stormy. You know? This is called Gray Horse. Uh, next image. And this is one is very recent. Um, this is, again, an attempt to, to, to take paint and make it almost be the photograph. So instead of taking a photograph of a head, I'm using, I, I put paint down and then painted around it. I had a head shape. And then I came in with all the photographic ears and eyes and nose. And then, of course, um, the hands and, and, and the rest is all, but it's called man with rain. Again, mm -hmm. rain's a big issue here. So next one. This is a, um, uh, again, just one of those things that happens. I had the, the, the dictionary page. I painted it with the black ink. And then by turning it and suddenly seeing that it was the shape of the horse, I was able to form this image. Mm -hmm. Next image. So these are the last ones I have. And these are actually very difficult to do. They're um, washes over panels. And what they are is they are paintings that I painted over, that paintings that I thought, you know, you're never going to go anywhere. You, you flunked out of school. You're just going to hang around the house for the next 20 years. So they all got um, painted over, gessoed over, mudded over. And then I came in with these beautiful ink washes, uh, laid down the washes. And then the, the washes were almost so beautiful that I couldn't get them to work mm -hmm. because they took over. So. I end up just doing these very simple um, uh, faces. This is called Snakehead. Next. This one is called Third Eye. Again, it's, and if you, if you can see them in life, the washes are just gorgeous because of what's underneath, the paintings that were underneath, you can see there was actually a photo that caused a little rectangle there. And then these are all the, as I said, I have hundreds of noses and eyes and lips and mouths and. And uh, the, the third eye, this is called third eye, was actually a graffiti eye. Huh. Uh, next slide. And what's incredible is <laughs> I know whose eyes everybody is. When I pick an eye, I can, even though my memory is not very good anymore, I can immediately know, oh, that's Lucy's eye or, you know, 
Um, and I have trillions of eyes. I mean, I, if I were around you guys, I'd be photographing you. <laughs> so this is called um, uh, work fa Working Face. And it's a little more complicated uh, because I added not just the eyes and the nose, but the, I added the mouth and the hands. But it's a sort of this blue collar working guy. So I think that's the last one. Oh, no, one more. One this more. is called yeah. Angry Face. <laughs> so, with those fists, you know, just ready to go. And again, the washes. Oh, no, no not the last one. No, I think this is the last one. Uh, this is called Eight Deer. And if, it's hard to see, but the, on, the, on the sweatshirt is actually a little picture of a, of a man beating another man. It was from a dictionary. And mm. oh, that's great. And uh, there was just something about this deer. Again, deer, I think, being symbolic of how awful we are to, to life because they're so kind of beautiful and helpless. And so it's this deer head, this deer figure with this figure being beaten on his chest. And it's called Eight Deer. Um, again, using the wash behind it to, to, to bring the whole thing forward. And then just that wonderful casual pose with the tennis shoes and the, but a lot of stuff's going on, you know, it's not, yeah. not a happy painting. Anyway, that is it, I think, isn't it, Liz? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. It, it's interesting that, thank you, Holly. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's interesting the where your work is right now, um, moving from the, what are our, clearly um, contrasting, colorful, even though the palettes are tend to be subtle, they're very dynamic, um, moving from that type of, of work on the panels to these very delicate but um, uh, intricate washes over, over the older work. Well, I had done, uh, I think it was six washes on small panels, and I had them for maybe six years because I couldn't figure yeah. out what to do with them. And yeah. then I did. I figured out yeah. the faces, and then I went ahead and did these bigger ones, yeah. um, sort of with the same idea. So yeah. it took a while to kind of figure it out. And they're yeah. so beautiful. You know, you don't want to. You, you, you're you're screwed because they're so yeah. beautiful. Well, we can see the real thing behind you in your studio right now. So there's so a there's eight, eight here. here. Yeah. And then yeah. there's the the angry. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think um, the coyote, the coyote plane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both for the um, present presentation part of that. Um, we do yeah. want to open up uh, the comment section here on uh, StreamYard, and I think if you're, you might be watching on YouTube, if I'm if I'm correct as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to um, to type those in now. Um, I do I do have my own while we while we see if anyone else has questions. Um, uh, just a f few things while you guys were talking. Um, it's interesting the sense of place that you're both trying to create and how you arrive um, at that. Um, Holly, with the photographic aspect of your work, like you're actually taking something that, you know, you're taking something real, you know, as real as it can be in a photograph. Um, and although they're characters, you, you're, you're recreating this sense of place that you're really witnessing. Um, and Tiang, you've got this sort of memories, imagined space that you're creating, but they seem uh, very solid, like based in, in something. So there's this really interesting connection between both of your, both of your works, between the, the way that you're creating a sense of place. Um, do either of you want to talk about that that space that you're um, that you're painting that you're envisioning? Well, I, I think I mentioned it earlier. I think both of us are trying to go to that other side, and we don't know what that space is on the other side till we get there. You know, yeah. but it's something that doesn't exist until we make it exist. But we yeah. don't know. You know, it sort of comes out. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Holly in, you know, in, uh, in a certain sense. And I think that for me, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's an idea of a time to, you know, having looking back and in, into my, my own memory and trying to recreate, but it's not like uh, excavation, you know, it's, uh, it's, 
it come out through the making process. So there's a very much the process of the making very much involved. It's not just a place, you know, there's a, a painting. That's also the event, mm. you know, so the event is not just like uh, the, the visual sense, but also how I am making it and how I'm also like just like processing, you know, the image and how am I like responding to it. But essentially, I think all those are like the location that you you kind of get a sense of Brian. I think like the the line work and all those things, I, I am hoping to transfer some sort of emotion or some sort of like specificity. So I think um, all those things are very much, you know, real to me, you know. So. Right. Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, your work to me is fairly emotional. Like it's very emotional. There's a heavy, sometimes heavy emotional space in your pieces that's um, very clear there. I mean, the, the big the big guy uh, with all these narratives happening inside of, of him, I say big guy, could be, I don't know, it, it could be you, it could be a, a, some other figure that's represented, but um, I mean, that, that figure is brooding and the rain coming down is very emotional. Um, and you, you know, in the show, of course, that's balanced with Holly's very lyrical, almost whimsical, but, but uh, a little, you know, there's a little bit of a um, little edge. <laughs> there's a little edge in there, especially knowing more about the work and the, the reanimation of life there. Um, you know, there's there's a play between the two that is is very strong. Yeah, there's Liz brought up the um, <clears throat> the sort of brooding fellow uh, or figure uh, in the piece. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I have also like a question for Holly, if I can. Um, I, I, like the history of photography and painting in itself is a very kind of like complex one, you know, and the way that you kind of like work with your work, working your your work, how do you kind of do you think about that? And the way you also apply photography in your work is the edges always have hard edges and in your painting for example is you know there's a soft edges is that's where it enter i think in the application of the brush stroke or kind of like putting more drippy marks so do you think that um well not do you think but uh, you know how do, how do you kind of like process that when you're making your work well, I'm completely, I'm, I'm someone who tries to check my brain out of the studio, just like go out and smoke a cigarette. I don't want you in here. So mostly I'm reactive. So with the paint, I'm reactive. With the photographs, I'm reactive. Um, it, and it's all intuitive. You know, it's all emotional. It's all, I mean, I mean, I can be a hot mess sometimes when I'm doing this stuff um, because it's, it is, I don't know where I'm going. It's scary. I'm, I'm like out on a limb, you know, and, and, uh, and then as soon as I get comfortable with something, then I stop doing it and I have to change it up. Um, so there, so anything I try and do consciously or use my brain, just forget it. It's just stupid. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, I, I never think about the history of anything or what this photographer did. I mean, I look at photographs, I look at painting, I love art, but I don't, I try and leave that out of the studio when I come in. Hmm. So you don't think about like the, the hard edge versus the soft edge? No, no, really? no. I only visually. I only think, does that work or not? I, but I don't think, oh, let's see, that's a soft edge. I should. I just visually it works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you change it. You make it work. Do you change a lot of the, like how, how many iterations does the, like one particular piece go through? Like how do you get through that layering process of work that, um, what's the, time commitment in saying yeah this is done you know how do you how do you move through that well i can have a piece that i'll work on for for a month you know just changing it and adding it and taking it thinking oh this is stupid oh no it's great oh good um, <laughs> and then sometimes it just happens in an instant you know and you think wow really good <laughs> or something you know and then that doesn't happen again the oil paintings that when i painted with the oils i would do one in a day 
I would, of course, I have the photographs ready. I put them up on the wall, and then it had to be done by the end of that day. And they were just exhausting. I don't think physically I can do that anymore. Liz is walking us through um, the uh, 3D virtual tour uh, of the gallery at Catalyst with your show up. And um, as folks can see if they haven't been to the been to the gallery space yet. Uh, I, I should mention that Saturday is the, the final day. We will be open uh, uh, tomorrow evening if, if uh, Tropical Storm Elsa doesn't wash us out. Uh, we'll be open as well, but um, Saturday will be the, the last day. I encourage people to come by and see the work in person, and especially uh, you know seeing work in person, the, the texture and the brushes and, and the work um, the application of, of medium is, you know, stunning when you get to see it, uh, for real, which, uh, we've all been craving so much over the last year is the, uh, is real interaction. Um, it's great, great for me to get to see the space. Cause I, of course, didn't come to the opening. It's such a beautiful space and it looks like a fantastic show. Thank you. It's been, it's been received pretty well. Um, um, we have a few minutes left. If there's any, uh, if there's any uh, comments available, I've, I've seen a, a congratulations on the show come through. Um, sometimes people don't have questions because the conversation's really great. Um, I'm assuming some people have seen the work in person and, and some have not. Um, one of the things we talked about uh, before uh, we went online um, was this idea um, for both of you, you can respond together or separately, but um, d how do you, how do the works incorporate um, cultural or personal mythologies? We've, we've touched on them a bit, um, but in, in both of your statements, this idea of mythology sort of pops up a bit. Um, and I thought maybe you could um, respond to that question. And again, we've talked a little bit about it, about some of this. Um, I, I brought up Castaneda. I was, you know, as a young photographer and anthropologist in undergraduate school, I, I latched onto some of those interesting books. Oh, uh, he was huge <laughs> in my life, just huge. Yeah. But for me, I mean, I think what I'm trying to do is, is we lived on the Zuni Indian Reservation for eight years, and then I spent time in Mexico living down there. So those are two cultures that I think I'm uh, always trying to sneak into my work. Um, and again, now with all the whole political thing, correctness, it's like, can I do that? You know, but mm -hmm. I lived there, I experienced it. And, and I think folk art too, is just hugely, uh, influenced me. And, and I, I'm always looking at good folk art. It's the best, you know, Bill mm -hmm. Trailer. Oh my God. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Tom, what about you? Yeah, I think that's, uh, a big thing in my work. And even now more that I'm more um my work has more consciously engaged in that i think and the one in the show i think looking back it was kind of odd um you know but seeing the differences and some of the tendency that i still have um you know good or bad but even you know those tendency that you just have without really thinking is this you know that's truly you you know and so i think that's some of the lines I, I saw, you know, those are the same tendency that I still have now. And even the atmosphere that you, you talked about, Brian, I think that's similar desire that I still have right now. Those are never really consciously decided, I think. Um, but in terms of personal mythology, that's, you know, that has been really existed. And only looking back now, I really understand it in that way because um in my birth country i think that uh, you know only a few century or maybe a hundred years ago or so it's uh a lot of people like still believed in an animism so you know um experiencing nature as a living a living thing and a living being is you know that's always one thing that's uh you know existed and i really didn't know that part of like history because of the um, the Christian, you know, conversion through Baptist missionary. And um, so that part of history has been kind of like 
I don't want to say erased, but uh, you know, kind of like fading, it faded. And the only way I had contact was through my grandma, through bedtime story. You know, don't and, you think you can say erased? I mean, really? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a strong word in the sense that like uh, the Christian baptism. It was in this case, it wasn't violent. You know, and but I think that if you look at culturally in the sense of that consequence, how much of consequence it had, I guess it can be violent, Holly. So yeah, you know, I'm just still kind of like processing a lot of that more consciously, you know, in my adulthood right now. So, but, so a lot of those, those things, you know, I, I'm thinking now and in my work, like in my current work, it's definitely more consciously engaged. So that, you know mythology of you know it's it's is it even mythology i don't know you know it's one of those things that that's also like ancestral like memories um that's also one thing that i, I think about and I, I think that they tend to come out in the same type of way with mythology but i certain you know sometimes don't look at it like mythology i certainly just see it as like an experience uh experiential like um Thing with nature yeah which is great because i feel like that's holly you're engaging that 100 percent is this animism and the the power of the the natural forces that we are a part of in our lives we don't always you know we have this conflicting space where we um see ourselves as above or separate from um you know quote unquote mother nature or nature itself Yet, how could we be anything but our our practices and the things that we've built and constructed and, and our ways of the world have moved us in directions that are both inherent and innate in our in the human possibility, but somehow seem uh, very distant from the rest of the animal life or life on Earth, right? Um, and you're mythologizing in a way you are hardening the mythologies of the power of animal life, of, of a natural life or living with nature. Um, I just think it's interesting that you said that, Tiang, that you're coming from a culture that um, there was a, a burying of those concepts and those ideas and that way of living and that experience of life um, altogether by, by a different experience. Um, it's fascinating. I, Honestly, never made the connection between that um, in the work. Um, I think it's got to be in Tiang's DNA. I mean, I think it's there must. and it's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, ancestral memory and our uh, group memory. You know, I, I, I've been curious about that, you know, if it's real, you know, in, in such, you know. Um, well, animals experience it. I mean, you know, um, I have this this turtle that comes all the way up from the lake near our house, it walks miles to get to our house and bury its eggs in our mulch pile every year. And those turtles leave and somehow make it miles if they don't get eaten by the fox uh, or the coyote all the way down back to the lake. And then when it's their turn, they come back to the same place. And tur sea turtles, do, I mean, so many different types of animals do that. Why should we be different? Why should those ancestral memories or things be different? You know, how could it? I mean, are we that so far apart from the animals and creatures around us that um, that we don't have those same experiences? That we can't remember these things that are somehow remembered in our in our DNA and passed down? And I think I'm looking to those cultures. You know, the Zuni culture, the Mexican culture because they have it more deeply than my horrible, you know, Anglo-Saxon culture. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to look to them to say, what's, what's real? What's going on? Help mm -hmm. me with this. Cause yeah. I sure don't have it in my history, you know, my white history. We have a different, it's been different, right? But you're, you want to reconnect to that and reconnect us to that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, we're wrapping up on an hour now. Um, I wanted to thank you both, both for um, exhibiting with us at Catalyst um, and also sharing your thoughts and um, 
experiences with us uh, over the last hour during this talk. Uh, I'll give you guys the last word. Is there something else that you want to uh, say to, um, to wrap up? No, just thank you so much for doing this for the show. It's, it's a beautiful show. I'm so glad to be showing with Tiang um, and to get to meet you guys. It's really been lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, you know, same. Thank you for, uh, you know, Holly, Brian, Liz, and it has been really delightful experience. And I genuinely, uh, you know, learned a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, being here in uh, Baltimore as well, I, you know, it was a really great experience. So I can't really say not anything else other than thank you. So. Well, thank you. And, and thank you both um, again for uh, for being with us. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, Cattle's Contemporary is in Mount Vernon in Baltimore. Um, we'll be open uh, tomorrow, Thursday from 5 to 7, and uh, Saturday. Um, actually, I think there'll be a couple extended hours on there, but we're typically open from 2 to 6. I think we'll have a little bit extra time uh, for you all to come in. You can check the hours on, on our website. Um, this will be our final show for the summer. Um, we'll re we'll close up for a little bit and relaunch, uh, at the beginning of September, um, with a solo show, um, uh, by Bill Duder, uh, who's uh, a state we've been working with, um, followed by a solo show by Damon Arhos. Um, and we hope that we'll maybe see some of you in Art Miami this year. It'll be our first first time in uh, showing in Miami. So I uh, look forward to seeing new faces down there. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And good night. Good night. Thank you.